Good evening, good evening. If you'd take your seats, we're just about to get started. Hi, Laura. <laughs> and be sure that you uh, fill out those little slips with your email because each program we draw tickets, um, we draw emails and we send you free tickets and you're entered into the grand prize drawing for five pairs of tickets and admission to a VIP reception. So be sure we have your email and if we don't, get one of the little slips on your way out and fill it out. So, good evening, welcome. I'm Barbara Lane, I'm the Director of Arts and Ideas here at the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco. Really happy to have you here on this beautiful, beautiful night. Our good season, our summer season, um, our Indian summer season. You will have an opportunity to ask questions of Lawrence Wright, so um, please be thinking of your questions. We'll come to you with a microphone and we hope that you'll participate. Wait for the microphone to get to you so the questions are audible, not only to he everyone here in the room, but for our radio program, Bina, which is heard every Thursday at noon on KALW FM 91.7. And Lawrence Wright will sign books following tonight's program, so we hope you'll take an opportunity to buy a book from our good friends at BookSync and get a book signed. Is everything okay here? Okay. All right. Okay. That's okay. And <laughs> now for this evening's program. New Yorker writer Lawrence Wright has written about the effects of extreme religious beliefs on people's lives. He won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Looming Tower, Al-Qaeda and the Road to 9-11. Going Clear is a revelatory look at the inner workings of the world of Scientology. And his new book, 13 Days in September, is the story of the peace accord between Israel and Egypt, brokered by Jimmy Carter, Menachem Begin, and Anwar Sadat at Camp David in 1978. Lawrence Wright is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and plays keyboard in the Austin-based Austin blues band, Who Do? Please join me in welcoming him to the JCCSF. Everybody loves the fact that I'm in a band. Uh, uh, let me tell you about how I got into a band. I, I took up piano when I was 38 and a half in order to play Great Balls of Fire on my 40th birthday. Um, and I, I never had the adolescence that all my band members had, so I'll never catch up to them. But uh, and it was the hardest thing I ever did. Uh, it turns out Great Balls of Fire is a difficult song to start with. And uh, you have to get your foot into it, for one thing. And, um, but, uh, and I'm still taking lessons many years later. Um, but it's just been one of the greatest pleasures of my life to be able to play music with my friends. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight a little bit about um, Camp David. And I'm going to talk about the, um, the men that made the peace possible. And I'm going to talk about the history that led up to Camp David and also the sort of biblical and Quranic and Torah uh, injunctions that underlie all of that. Um, this book had a very unusual beginning, as unique in my experience. Um, normally, if you write a play or, or a movie, you adapt a book. In this case, I went the other direction. In 2011, I got a call from Gerald Rafshoon, who was Jimmy Carter's media advisor in the White House. And um, he wanted to, add, he asked me if I would consider writing a play about Camp David, the 1978 summit where Jimmy Carter, Menachem Begin, and Anwar Sadat met for 13 tumultuous days. And his pitch was, this was when a born-again Christian, a pious Muslim, and an Orthodox Jew went behind closed doors for 13 days and emerged with the first and most durable treaty in the Middle East. Well, it was a pretty convincing pitch for me because, for one thing, I had lived in Atlanta when Carter was governor and when he ran for president. 
And I had lived in Cairo. I taught at the American University when Sadat became president after the death of Gamal Abdel Nasser. And I had been to Israel on several occasions as a reporter. So I felt, a, I felt called to this project. But especially, I wanted to overcome some of my own uh, doubts about the possibility of peace. You know, we all get so cynical, or maybe that's not the right word, uh, despairing about the idea that there can be peace between Jews and Arabs. Are they doomed forever to be eternal enemies? And uh, so I, I was drawn to to do this, but uh, for the play, I insisted that I would treat it just the way I would treat a New Yorker story or a book, I would research it as I do in my journalism. And I would uh, talk to the surviving members of the delegations in the US and Egypt and, and Israel. So it began with Jerry Refshoon taking me to Plains to meet the Carters. Um, they live in a very modest house, a little ranch house that they built uh, in the mid-50s. Uh, Jimmy Carter was a naval officer with a very promising career, and his, uh, his father died. And uh, he came back to Plains and decided that he had to take over the family peanut warehouse, um, which was bankrupt, more or less, at the time. And Rosalind did not want to go back to Plains. All the way home, you know, from from Annapolis, they, uh, she wouldn't talk to him. She would communicate to the, through the children, tell your father that I, she was, you know, I don't know how long that lasted, but boy, she was not happy about going back to Plains. And um, the, uh, they lived in <clears throat> public housing uh, when they got back. Uh, the only president, I think, who's ever lived in public housing. Uh, for those of you who collect nickel knowledge, uh, he's also the first president born in a hospital uh, because of his mother, a nurse, Ms. Lillian, if those of you are old enough to remember her, what a president she was. So went to Plains. Uh, president and his wife are sitting on this blue chintz couch with um, blue chintz matching curtains. And behind the couch, there is a painting of the room that we're in, the den that Jimmy Carter painted himself. It looks like an illustration from Goodnight Moon. <laughs> and Jerry says, uh, Mr. President, Larry uh, works for the New Yorker. He recently wrote a, a, an article about Scientology. Oh, I read that. I found that most intriguing. <laughs> and at the time, I was trying to decide who else was going to be on the stage. I knew that I had Carter, Begin, and Sadat, but were there any other characters? And then Rosalind turned to him and said, since when did you start reading The New Yorker? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a woman that was born in the house next door to Jimmy Carter. And he's going to be 90 on October 1st. So they've known each other for almost a century. And uh, they still have that relationship. And I had decided at that moment that I had a fourth character because I needed a person who could talk to Jimmy Carter in that tone of voice. Rosalind turned out to be very helpful to me. I learned, for instance, that it was her idea to have Camp David. Uh, Carter had planned some international conference in Geneva that was really doomed from the beginning. And he was very discouraged about it. And he and Rosalind went to Camp David. And she said, why not bring them here? And, uh, you know, get them away from their problems at home. And, you know, and he, he decided that's exactly what he would do. So Camp David really began with Rosalind Carter. She was also helpful to me. I, I read in her memoir that uh, she had kept a personal diary while she was at Camp David, 200 typewritten pages, she said. And um, so when I was in Plains, I said, uh, Mrs. Carter, I, I sure would like to have a look at that diary. And uh, oh, it's around here somewhere. Uh, no effort to find it. And uh, so the Carter Center didn't know anything about it. And I kept pestering Raf Shun. And finally, he called President Carter. And a week later, a brown manila envelope arrives. 
and it's Rosalind's diary. And it was very helpful because it, it helped chart the emotional course of events through those 13 days, which were so, uh, such a roller coaster. It every, every day had some terrible crisis in it. It was just a nauseating emotional journey. And um, so I, I, I highlighted some of the material and made some marginal notes. And a month later, Jerry calls me and says, Larry, where's that diary? Rosalind wants it back. It's her only copy. So for future historians, it was me. <laughs> I'm the one that marked it all up. Um, I, um, that all resulted in a play that was uh, premiered at the arena stage in Washington in the spring, and it was one of the highlights of my life. I, I had a, it was a wonderful experience, but I, by the time we put the play on, I had already written several drafts of this book. I, I decided that there was just so much more to say. There were, there were many more characters than I was able to write about in the play, but also so many important issues that are still before us were on the table at Camp David. And I thought this was an opportunity for me to understand in a deep way the roots of this conflict, which keep the Middle East in constant tumult and are always threatening world order. So much tragedy has emerged from this region, so many wars, so many refugees, so much terrorism, and so little hope. It's common to think that seeking peace, especially in the Middle East, is a fool's errand. So it's useful to look back at one moment in history when peace actually was achieved. Not a total comprehensive peace, to be sure, but a lasting and durable peace between two nations that had been engaged in four wars in a single generation. In the first 30 years of Israel's existence, Egypt and Israel were almost engaged in continual warfare. In the 35 years since the Camp David Accords were signed, there hasn't been a single violation of the treaty on either side. This is the story of how that peace was made. In writing the book, I decided I would impose three chronologies on the narrative. The 13 agonizing days that Carter, Begin, and Sadat met on that forested mountaintop in Maryland formed the architecture of the book. But beneath that is the history of the modern Middle East seen through the eyes of the remarkable men who were present at Camp David. And then under that, as I said, the tectonic plates of the Bible, the Quran, and the Torah that continue to shape modern history. The struggle for peace at Camp David is a testament to the enduring force of religion and the difficulty of shedding the mythologies that lure societies into conflict. Let's begin with the biblical concept of the promised land, the legend that is at the root of this conflict. In Genesis, God speaks to Abraham in a dream, pledging to give to him and his descendants the land between the Nile and the Euphrates, a grant that would include southern Turkey, half of Iraq, parts of Saudi Arabia, all of Syria, Israel, Jordan, the West Bank, uh, Sinai and half of Egypt. Later, God makes a similar pledge to Moses as he leads his people out of Egypt, although now the boundaries are the Red Sea to the Euphrates. On another occasion, God tells Moses the promised land is actually Canaan, a, a different entity that is more similar to modern Israel plus the West Bank and most of Lebanon. Defining borders in the Middle East has always been a problem even for God. <laughs> when the wandering Israelites reach the River Jordan, God draws Moses to the peak of Mount Nebo and shows him the Promised Land, which stretches out before him all the way to the Mediterranean. This is the land about which I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord tells Moses. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over. And so Moses dies at the age of 120, having led his people out of Egypt and through the wilderness of Sinai. 
God instructs Moses' successor, Joshua, to take the Israelites into the promised land, saying, Every place you set foot, I have given you. However, the land is not vacant. The story of Joshua's conquest of the promised land is one of the most shocking events in the Bible. Cities are burned to the ground, populations are annihilated, every man, woman, and child, even the livestock, all on the orders of the Lord to kill every living thing. In that way, the children of Israel finally came into the possession of the promised land. One of the many problems with the biblical account of the Exodus is that all of this territory was part of the ancient Egyptian empire. The 31 kings that Joshua was supposed to have executed, they were all vassals of Egypt, and they were paying taxes to the Pharaoh before, during, and after the supposed Israelite invasion. From the earliest times, the Egyptian people have shown a great talent for bureaucracy. They kept extensive records. There's no historical or archaeological evidence that the Israelites were ever in Egypt. The Bible records that 603,550 Israelite men above the age of 20, plus their wives and children and various hangers-on, a horde estimated at more than 2 million people, wandered in Sinai for 40 years on their journey to the Promised Land. Marching 10 abreast, they would have stretched more than 150 miles, more than, greater than the actual width of the peninsula of Sinai. There's no evidence of that either. Archaeologists have excavated most of the cities that Joshua is said to have raised. Many were not inhabited at the time or were not destroyed. On the other hand, there are abundant remains of Egyptian military outposts and administrative centers that testify to the imperial rule of one of the great empires of the ancient world. So if the exodus occurred in some fashion, the Israelites were making a journey from one part of Egypt to another. The Bible doesn't mention that either. The most likely explanation for the origin of the Israelites is that they are themselves the Canaanites. DNA studies indicate that Jews and Palestinians are very closely related. Both of them descended from the Canaanites. Genetically, they're the same people. Both have been in the same place for thousands of years. But the three men who met at Camp David in September 1978 accepted the biblical account, as do believers in the Abrahamic religions all over the world. Even Sadat believed that God had chosen the Jews and had led them to the Promised Land. But as a Muslim, he also believed that Jews had broken their covenant with the Lord and he had turned against them. Now I'm going to sketch out a little bit of the modern history leading up to Camp David. In November of 1947, the UN voted to partition the former Ottoman province of Palestine into two parts, one to be a Jewish state and the other to be reserved for the Palestinian people. The following May, the state of Israel came into being along with its doomed twin, Palestine. Five Arab armies immediately attack. It wasn't just Israel they were attacking. It was a land grab for Palestine. Jordan took the West Bank, Egypt took Gaza, and Israel took the rest. So much for Palestine. In 1956, after Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal, Israel conspired with England and France to attack Egypt and take over the canal. President Eisenhower was so infuriated with this that he forced the Israelis to surrender the Sinai and sent the, in, in threatened England with cutting off, uh, sabotaging the pound, which was under attack, and the French retreated. Uh, it was really the end of England and France's great powers. And after that, the United States took over the Middle East account. It also consolidated in the minds of Arabs that Israel was an outpost of Western imperialism. In 1967, 
Nasser demanded that UN peacekeepers be removed from Sinai, and he cut off access to the Straits of Tehran, which Israel considered to be acts of war. In June, Israel attacked and wiped out three Arab armies in six days. Israel seized the West Bank, the old city of Jerusalem, which had been under Jordanian control since 1948, and it also took the Golan Heights from Syria, as well as the, the Sinai Peninsula, including Gaza, from Egypt. It tripled the size of Israel, adding a million and a half Arabs. At the time, Israel only had a few more than two million Jews. Now, let me mention something about the psychological effect of the 1967 war. Before 1967, Jews were leaving Israel in great numbers. There was a sense of pessimism about its future. And shortly before the war, gas masks were being passed out. There were trenches dug in the city parks for mass graves. They expected thousands and thousands of casualties. But in the space of an hour, the Egyptian Air Force was destroyed. The war was essentially over. Israel's lightning victory excited Jews all over the world. They began immigrating to the country in great numbers, believing that prophecy was being fulfilled. And many Christians believe this as well. There was a the consolidation of Israel hearkened to the idea of the end of days when the Messiah returns. The thrill of rapture was in the air. For Muslims, the humiliation of the Six-Day War was also a very profound event. They asked themselves, many of them, has God turned against us? And if so, why? And the answer for so many Muslims was, we were not good enough Muslims. We were not pure enough. And so they turned to more radical and fundamentalist forms of Islam. And radical Islam began to be stirred into life and express itself in acts of terror. After the Six-Day War, the UN passed Resolution 242, which Israel signed. It states that Israel would withdraw from territories occupied in the 1967 war. It doesn't say all territories, and it doesn't say the territories. It just says territories, leaving open the idea that this was negotiable, except serious negotiations never took place. Settlements immediately began springing up in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Golan, and Sinai. If there's one lesson to be learned from studying the wars of the Middle East, it is that neither victory nor peace, victory nor defeat brings peace. One more merely lays the groundwork for the next one. And so, in October 1973, on Yom Kippur, Egypt stunned Israel by sending its vast army across the Suez Canal. Simultaneously, Syria attacked, seeking to recapture its lost Golan Heights. Israel was caught by surprise. Within 24 hours, Israel lost 200 tanks, 35 aircraft, hundreds of soldiers killed. Within two days, those losses had doubled. In desperation, Israel turned to the U.S. for help. And Nixon agreed to resupply the Israeli Defense Force, just as the Soviets were resupplying the Arab forces. American intelligence believes that Israel was then arming its nuclear arsenal in case of an overwhelming defeat. But Israel recovered and broke through Egyptian lines and crossed the Suez Canal and trapped the Egyptian Third Army in the Sinai Desert. This caused the Soviets to put three airborne divisions on alert and send a naval flotilla into the region. Nixon, under siege by Watergate, drinking way too heavily, put the nation, raised the nation's nuclear alert to the highest level it had been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. It took very skillful negotiation by Henry Kissinger to bring this superpower train wreck to a halt and disentangle those two armies in the Sinai. This was the story. 
of the first 30 years of Israel's existence, near continual warfare with his neighbors, but especially with Egypt, the only Arab country that posed a genuine threat to Israel's existence. Now let's take a look at the three men who would meet at Camp David. Jimmy Carter was a one-term governor of Georgia when he was elected president of the United States in 1976. A very obscure political figure at the time. Uh, his informal campaign motto was Jimmy Who. <laughs> you remember that? The Carters were the only white family in this little village hamlet called Archery near outside of Plains. There were 55 other black families. Rosalind says that when Jimmy was a boy, his accent was indistinguishable from his black playmates. He and his best friend, Alonzo Davis, would go to the movie together. together. Uh, in archery, there was a train track, and you could stand out there and wave the train down, and the boys would get on the train, Jimmy in one car and Alonzo in another, and they would go into uh, the, a nearby town uh, where there was a movie theater, and Alonzo would go up in the balcony and Jimmy would go downstairs, and then they would come back to the train and go into the separate cars. That was going to the movie together. Um, the only Jew that Carter knew as a boy was his uncle, Louis Brownstein, who was uh, an insurance salesman in Chattanooga who had married Carter's mother's sister. Uncle Louis uh, could chin himself with one hand, and this made a huge impression on <laughs> young Jimmy Carter. The first Arab he met was at the Daytona 500 when he was governor of Georgia. So that was his experience uh, until he went to, to Israel in 1973 when he was secretly considering a run for the presidency. If you want to know who's secretly considering a run for the presidency, you can always check the travel log to Israel. It's a, um, <laughs> So he got to Israel, and uh, Golda Meir was the prime minister, and she lent them a station wagon. And they drove around Israel and into the West Bank. They bathed in the River Jordan where they believed that Jesus was baptized. And um, Carter, he was, you know, naive about the region, but he, at the time he estimated there were 1,500 settlers in the West Bank and he could see that they already posed a formidable threat to peace. Uh, he was surprised how secular they were. He and Rosalind went to a synagogue in the West Bank and there were only two other people there. So when he returned the station wagon to Golda Meir, he chided her. He said that whenever the Jews turn away from God, they are punished politically and militarily. And Golda Meir laughed in his face. The governor of Georgia, right? A few months later, Sadat sent his army over the canal, and Golda Meir had to step down. Carter came home determined to do whatever he could to, for, for the future of Israel. He had, when he first ran for governor, he ran against Lester Maddox, one of the most racist figures in Georgia's history. Um, I, I interviewed Lester Maddox once years ago, but uh, he, he made his reputation by check, chasing black patrons of his restaurant, the Pickwick, out of the restaurant with an ax handle and, handle and a pistol. His other great talent was riding a bicycle backwards. It was really pretty interesting. But he became the governor of Georgia over Jimmy Carter. And this was a shattering moment in Carter's career. Uh, this is when he had his born-again experience. Uh, his sister, who was an evangelist, came and helped him through this troubled time. And he began running for governor again almost immediately. His biggest supporter in that second race for governor, interestingly enough, was an, an Iranian Jew named David Rabham, who was a wealthy businessman in Savannah and also a pilot. And um, he flew Carter all over the state when he was making his, his campaign speeches and uh, so much time in the air that Carter actually learned how to fly that little Cessna while Rabham napped. 
And uh, one one day they were flying across the state, and uh, Ravum is napping, and and Carter is flying, and and suddenly the engine conked out, and um, he looked, and the gas was empty, and he punched David, 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 you know, David. Yeah, of what? We're out of gas. And Ravum says, well, then we're going to crash. <laughs> and he let that sit there for a moment, and then he turned on the spare gas tank. <laughs> Very few people tease Jimmy Carter. And um, so it shows you the, the degree of their relationship. Um, so later in the flight, Carter says to him, uh, we're coming to the end of the campaign and it appears that I might be elected governor and, and you've been such a great supporter of, of mine what can I do for you and Ravum said I don't need anything from you there's only one thing I want from you I want you to tell the people of Georgia that we have to do something about the race problem that has held us back for so many generations and so Carter took a flight map an old flight map and he wrote on the flight map I say to you that the time for racial discrimination is over. And he handed it to Ravum and he said, if I'm inaugurated, I will say this. And Ravum said, sign it. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was inaugurated and he did say those words and that got him on the cover of Time magazine and planted the seeds of his candidacy. He came into the presidency believing, as he told me, God had placed him in that high office in order to bring peace to the Holy Land. Walter Mondale told me he was shocked. He was Carter's vice president. On the first day in office, Carter told him he intended to bring a comprehensive peace to the Middle East. The last thing that any American president should be thinking of is such a, a trap for politicians and has been for so long. None of Carter's uh, advisors encouraged this idea. But he began meeting with leaders from the Middle East uh, to interview them, see what they thought. They always come to pay homage to the new president. And he was so discouraged by the people that he met until Anwar Sadat came along. Jimmy Carter fell in love. He actually would say that he loved Anwar Sadat. It's not normal language for inter international diplomacy. And, <laughs> His, his advisors would, they, they recognized that there was some spark between these two men. And I've analyzed it as well as I can. I, I think there are, there are a number of things, similarities that they have. One, they, but they both grew up in very rural environments. Uh, Carter said that, you know, the South Georgia farm where he plowed behind a mule, you know, would have been recognizable to Jesus, you know, in that era. Uh, it was, you know, very primitive. And, and Sadat grew up in the Nile Delta plowing behind a water buffalo, both of them barefoot boys. Uh, I think another thing that meant something to Jimmy Carter, Carter, that Anwar Sadat was black. Uh, his mother was the daughter of an emancipated slave, and he inherited that dark African coloring, which strikes against you even in Egypt. Um, and I think that Carter kindled to that feeling of fraternity that he had as a young boy growing up in, in the rural South. Sadat grew up in the little village of Mit Abel Kum in the Nile Delta, and he always seemed to be on the lookout for destiny. When he was just a, a little boy, he would follow, you know, followed some older boys and they, they all j jumped into this irrigation ditch to go swimming. And he jumped in too. And then he thought, oh, I can't swim. And his thought, as he later recounted, if I die, Egypt will have lost Anwar Sadat. When he was 12, Mahatma Gandhi came, passed through the Suez Canal on his way to London to negotiate the future of India. And Sadat idolized this small brown man who could overthrow an empire. And he began to imitate him. He took off his clothes and began wearing an apron. He, uh, he made a spindle and went up on the roof of his house to start spinning clothes. His father said, come down, you're gonna get pneumonia. 
um, it was that same uh, interest in historic figures that also drew him to Adolf Hitler. Um, it wasn't unusual in Egypt during the war uh, for Egyptians to be on the side of the Germans because they were fighting the, the, the English and the English were occupying Egypt. But even after World War II, after 10 million people were dead, uh, Sadat was asked with some other people to write a f hypothetical letter to Hitler. And he wrote about how much he still admired him. When he was a 23-year-old captain in the Egyptian army in, in 1942, he, uh, he tried to make an alliance with General, uh, the German General Edwin Rommel, the, the desert fox who was in Alamein in northern Egypt at the time. And uh, the way that he tried to uh, reach out to, <laughs> to Rommel is he had a friend uh, take a message to him and fly uh, into uh, the German camp. And the friend flew in in a British plane and was shot down. So that message didn't get through. Uh, but then Sadat collaborated with a pair of Nazi spies. Um, and he was also a member of what he called the Murder Society. This was, you know, a group of Egyptians who would, mainly they would pick off uh, British soldiers who were wandering in the streets at night, drunk and alone. And Sadat redirected their energies to try to kill political figures, like twice they tried to assassinate the Egyptian prime minister because he was collaborating with the British. And they did succeed in killing another government minister. Sadat spent five years in prison before he escaped. And eventually, he was able to return to the army, and he participated in the 1952 coup by military officers. I was in Cairo when Nasser died, and, and, and nobody thought Sadat was going to last. For one thing, he was a, a joke. People, he missed the revolution. He was at the movie. Uh, he saw a double feature. And the revolution happened while he was in the theater. Uh, Everybody just thought, oh, you know, first strong man to come along will push him aside. Well, lo and behold, within a year, he had rounded up all of Nasser's corrupt cronies and thrown them in prison. When I was living in Egypt, there, were no, there was no diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Egypt. And there were only a couple hundred Americans in the whole country. But there were Russians everywhere. And Sadat threw out 15,000 Soviet troops. Um, and then, in 1977, he made this speech in the Egyptian parliament saying that he would do anything. He would go to the ends of the earth. He would even go to the heart of Israel, to Jerusalem, to speak in the Knesset to their parliament if it would help advance the cause of peace. Well, nobody, everybody applauded it, but nobody believed him. Even Yasser Arafat, who was there, applauded. It wasn't even reported in the paper the next day. Two weeks later, Sadat arrives in, in Israel. It was one of the most amazing experiences in the Middle East. No, no other Arab leader would even acknowledge the existence of Israel. And suddenly, you have the leader of the most important Arab nation reaching out and flying into Israel. He did go speak to the Knesset, and he laid out his plan for peace, which he said had to be a, not, it could not be a separate peace. It had to be a comprehensive peace. It had to include the Palestinians. So he left Israel empty-handed. And in large part, that was because of one man, Menachem Begin. This is a man whose entire career had been devoted to expanding the territory of the land of Israel, not ceding any of that territory. He was born in a little Polish town called Brisk. His first memory was of Polish soldiers flogging a Jew in a public park. When the Nazis invaded Poland, 5,000 Jews in Brisk were executed. Begin's mother was in the hospital with pneumonia, and the Nazis went through the hospital and murdered the patients in their beds. His father was tied up. His pockets were weighted down with rocks, and he was drowned in the river Bug. 
Menachem was hiding in Lithuania at the time, and he would spend two years in Soviet prisons before Stalin let all the Poles out to, to fight the Nazis. The Jewish unit that Begin joined was sent to Palestine, and there he became head of Irgun, a terrorist group that targeted the British. One of the one of the most famous strikes that he made against the British was the King David Hotel, which a, one part of the hotel was a nerve center for the British mandate, but it was an operating hotel with a fancy restaurant and so on. And uh, the Irgun bombed it, killed 91 people. Uh, and uh, But Irgun struck daily, sometimes more than once a day, it was an ongoing campaign of terror that had rarely been seen before. Um, and he had a great talent for theater, for doing the thing that would catch the headlines, uh, especially in London and New York. Um, for instance, uh, the British would sometimes flog people they caught acting in, in criminal behavior. And so when two ergonists were flogged, Begin captured a couple of British officers and flogged them as well. That went all over the world. Uh, and then when the British hanged three ergonists who had been convicted of terrorist crimes, Begin hanged two British sergeants he had captured and booby-trapped their bodies. This was too much for the British. They they gave up and they decided to leave the mandate and turn the problem over to the UN. Begin created a kind of template for terror that has even Bin Laden uh, read his book, uh, Revolt. Um, it, it became a kind of playbook for terrorists of the future. In 1948, when Israel was fighting for its independence, Ergun troops attacked a little Palestinian village called Deir Yassin. Uh, Deir Yassin was a peaceful village that had actually made a non-aggression pact with his ultra-Orthodox neighbors. But Begin decided that it stood above a strategic approach to Jerusalem and it had to be taken. His story is that he sent a sound truck at four in the morning to warn everybody to leave, but the truck fell into a ditch and nobody heard the warning. And when the, when the attackers ran into some moderate resistance, they responded by going house to house and throwing grenades through the windows, blowing up the houses with TNT. It was a massacre. Um, some of the surviving women and children were put on flatbed trucks and driven through old city of Jerusalem where they were jeered at and some 20 men who were captured were taken to a quarry and shot. There were Palestinians who had fled Israel before that. But after that, the great exodus took place. 750,000 Palestinians left. And Begin was denounced by Jews all over the world. Uh, he came to New York that, later that same year, and Albert Einstein and Hannah Arendt uh, took out a Front page, a front section ad in the New York Times denouncing uh, Begin and asking him for him not to come to New York. Even in Israel, Begin was seen as an extremist and a marginal figure on the sidelines of Israeli politics. David Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, called him a little Hitler, a racist and a fascist who only wants to kill Arabs. But in 1973, when Sadat's forces crossed the Suez Canal, Israelis began to look upon Begin differently. Perhaps he was the strong man who could return Israel to that sense of invulnerability that it had briefly enjoyed after the 1967 war. So these were the men who came to Camp David while the wounds of war were still fresh. Are there lessons? in the Camp David experience that we could learn from today? I, th I will offer several that I think will help frame our current failed efforts. There are no perfect partners for peace. 
Look at the cast of characters who were at Camp David. An assassin, a Nazi sympathizer, a terrorist, a failing president. Could you imagine a le less likely group of people who could bring <laughs> peace? But they had one quality, each of them, in abundance that they shared, and that was political courage. Timing isn't everything. It's true that the 1973 Yom Kippur War shook Israel out of this reverie of unchallenged dominance and changed the political context. But the surprise attack that Sadat engineered only reinforced in the minds of many Israelis the need to hang on to Sinai as a strategic barrier. In Egypt, not just in Egypt, in the whole Arab world, Sadat was essentially alone in his belief that peace with Israel was possible or even desirable. Two of his foreign ministers resigned when, uh, in succession after he went to Jerusalem, and the third one resigned at Camp David. The, the Egyptian delegation was so hostile to Sadat's effort to make peace at Camp David that Jimmy Carter actually believed that they might kill Sadat at, Sam, at Camp David. <laughs> no, sounds crazy. But at 4 in the morning, Carter woke up Brzezinski, his national security advisor who ran around in his pajamas reinforcing the security around Sadat's cabin because Carter was so convinced that the Egyptians were going to do in their leader, which they did eventually. But, but that was the atmosphere that pervaded the camp. And Carter had his own political troubles. He was struggling with a faltering economy, double-digit inflation, remember stagflation, gas lines, a revolution in Iran, a midterm congressional election, and his political advisors unanimously opposed his quixotic decision to seek peace in the Middle East when there were so many pressing problems at home. Save it for your second term, they all told him. The final lesson from this is that America plays a crucial role. Egypt and Israel simply couldn't make peace by themselves. Carter had a completely mistaken and naive idea when he brought them to Camp David. He thought if he could just get these two men together alone in the woods, they'd come to like each other and trust each other. <laughs> and uh, by the end of the second day, they couldn't even talk to each other. And, uh, and by the fifth day, he had to take control of it himself and issue an American plan. And he threatened both of these leaders that if you are the cause of the failure of the talks, I will let the American people know. Uh, Sadat had ordered a helicopter. He was leaving, and Carter told him that he would break off relations and Egypt would be friendless in the world. And he, told, he threatened Begin he was going to go to the Congress. and tell. He even had his speechwriter write a speech asking the Israeli people to, to throw their government out, if you can imagine. So these are some of the lessons of the success of Camp David, but there are lessons in its failure as well. The Accords sketch out a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, which has never been implemented. It has been the basis of every attempt since then to bring an end to this conflict. Peace requires painful compromises that neither side has been willing to make, and yet the alternative is unending strife. If there's one final lesson of Camp David, it is that peace is worth the price. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, questions or comments or actually I, I'll start off with All a right. question. Um, one of the extraordinary things to me is 13 days. I mean, in this world where everything's moving so quickly, this world of email and so forth, would it ever be possible again for three leaders to come together for that amount of time? Well, Barbara, they, nobody thought it was going to be 13 days. Carter thought it would be three or four days. And Begin thought two or three. You know, no, they, they, nobody budgeted 13 days. And um, yet Carter believed, you know, as he said again and again, will there ever be a time when there are leaders that have more courage than you, when we have a better opportunity to make peace? Here we are. Let's do it. And... And the, the, those 13 days, it's just hard. Uh, we look back on it and they say, well, they went to the woods and they made peace. But it, every day, 
brought some unbelievable crisis. And even the last day, the 13th day, Sunday, uh, the networks had been alerted. They were going to sign the cords that night at the White House. The chairs were being arranged in the East Room. And Carter had promised Sadat, you know, they'd taken Jerusalem off the table as it was too hot to discuss. But he, Carter promised Sadat that he would write a side letter st restating the American position on Jerusalem, which is that it's occupied territory. And um, the side letter had no legal standing. In fact, there were many side letters in the Camp David Accords where each party states its position without agreeing to anything. So Carter wrote that the American position on uh, Jerus East Jerusalem is that it is occupied, it is as it, it was stated by three American UN ambassadors beginning with Arthur Goldberg and then he quoted them saying that it's occupied territory. Well, the letter gets into Begin's hands and he explodes. How can you do this to me? You betrayed me. And the, the, the agreement is off. Uh, you know, you, you, have to, you have to retract this letter. And Carter was, this is just a letter about our position. It does, it's not policy. The policy has already been there. I'll, you know, I'll write another letter. What can you say that, would, you know, that we could accept? You know, it was, um, it, 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 Carter was befuddled and he was completely despairing. Uh, it was the lowest moment in his life because it had seemed after this tumultuous period of time he finally had an agreement and it all blew up because of this one letter on Jerusalem. And uh, he, he went back to his room and he, he wrote another letter uh, and he said the American policy is as it is stated by the UN ambassadors, and he didn't quote them. Uh, but his secretary, Susan Clow, uh, Carter had asked for some photographs to be made up of the three men at Aspen Lodge where they were negotiating uh, to give as souvenirs uh, to Begin's grandchildren. He had nine grandchildren. And so Susan got the names. She called Israel and got the names of Begin's grandchildren. And so Carter went back to give uh, this other letter, which was the same letter, um, to Begin. And, uh, and he handed this manila envelope with the photographs in it. And Begin was frigid, frigid. Their relationship was over. And uh, he said, goodbye, Mr. President, you know. And then he, he opened the envelope and he looked and he saw the picture and, you know, it was inscribed to his granddaughter, Arid. And then next one, Michal, and then Jonathan. And he began to weep. And Carter also burst into tears. And he said, I had hoped to write, this is where your grandfather and I made peace in the Middle East. So he went back to his cabin and he met with Sadat and told him that, that the signing was off that evening. There was going to be no accord. And Begin called and said he would sign. Wow. So there's a question over there. So you may have just touched on it. I was wondering uh, in your research what you learned about what caused Menachem Begin uh, to, to trust Sadat and to act counter to the kind of uh, policies he had espoused up to that moment and decide to yield land and yield peace. And just a corollary to that, what role, if any, uh, was the subject of Gaza in, in those negotiations? Well, I don't think that Begin ever trusted Sadat. I think that what happened is that Carter put the U.S. relationship with Israel on the table. And when Begin came to Camp David, he really could have left without an agreement. He felt he had nothing to lose. And then when Carter brought forward an American plan and made it very clear that if the Israelis were the cause of the failure of the talks, that he would publicly blame them, suddenly Begin had something far greater at stake, which was its dependence on the United States. And so I think both, you know, everybody in the Israeli delegation, Moshe Dayan, Ezra Weissman, Aaron Barak, they all were trying to push Begin because they all wanted peace more than he did. And I think Begin wanted it too. 
but he couldn't make peace with Israel. He, he, they all, and he had to make concessions to the United States. And so I think both Sadat and Begin made concessions to the United States they couldn't make to each other in order to get the peace that both of them needed. As for Gaza, Barack, Avram Barak was a very influential negotiator there. He became the Supreme Court Justice, head justice in Israel. And, and um, he kept telling Sadat, take Gaza, take Gaza. <laughs> and Sadat said, I don't want Gaza. Uh, <laughs> nobody wanted Gaza. And so it's, it's still in that uh, unfortunate no man's land that it is today. Uh, two questions. The first, do you envision that your play will be produced in any other, uh, any other productions? Well, we're trying to get to Broadway, uh, and I'm, I, I am very eager to take it to Israel. We had a lot of interest in Israel, but the producers are interested mainly in going to New York and then whatever. But I, frankly, I, I would love to go to Israel right away, and maybe to Egypt and UAE. Our, our, our Sadat character was an Egyptian movie star. Khaled Nabawi, he's gorgeous, but they, and he's a big star in, in Egypt, and he could easily get us booked into the opera house if, uh, if we wanted to. So maybe we would have a Middle East tour. And also, was the reason that Sadat was assassinated because he participated in these uh, negotiations with, with Israel? Yeah, that was a big part of it. Uh, he signed his death warrant when he signed those accords. And... Um, I don't know if he knew it. Uh, he was he became very unpopular in Egypt, uh, partly because of the radical Islamist current that was being stirred up. And um, you know, there was a very conservative wave sweeping over Egypt after the nineteen sixty seven war. When I taught in Egypt uh, sixty nine to seventy one, it was just beginning. Um, the girls in my classroom were not covered, and now they're all covered. But uh, the hijab was, you know, beginning to make itself apparent, and uh, and Sadat ridiculed it, called it a tent, and um, you know there were he was provoking, uh, but he was an autocrat, and he felt that he could, uh, but he unleashed a lot of furies. In in he was the modernizer. And he was fighting against a very retrograde conservative current. And um, in 1981, in October, on the anniversary of the Suez crossing, he was killed by his own army. Um, and there was a, a plan afoot uh, by uh, a, an Islamist cell to bomb the, uh, the funeral parade. Uh, and one of the conspirators was Ayman al Zawahri. Uh, I wrote about this in the Looming Tower. Uh, Zawahri, now the head of Al Qaeda, but uh, he was, it, it was broken up and he was captured on his way to the airport right after that. I wonder if there's any uh, lesson that you think might usefully be applied to uh, solving the remaining problems, either in this or the next administration. Uh, remaining problems between Israel and and, uh, and the Arabs. Yes, I do think there is. Uh, th here's my thinking about it. And I, I'm still struggling with how to explain what seem sometimes contrary thoughts in my own mind. I think there is a logic of war and there's a logic of peace. In the logic of war, for instance, if rockets are flying out of Gaza, you can't have that. You, you know, the proper response is to stop that. And so I don't blame the Israelis for going in in the logic of war to try to stop the rockets. But as long as there's no peace, there are going to be rockets. It's just the nature of things. Uh, and similarly, we're dealing with ISIS um, and Syria. Well, what we're really dealing with is an Islamic civil war. And until the two sides of Islam are reconciled, until there's peace in the house of Islam, then we're always going to see this. I mean, if you look at the terrorist groups that have plagued the Middle East, 
Hamas, Hezbollah, al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, uh, they're all proxy armies of either the Saudis or the Iranians, and they're employed against each other. If we can put a stop to that by getting the Saudis and the Iranians to reconcile, uh, then we would, see, we would see the mentality degraded and destroyed. That, but, uh, you know, militarily, I think it's important to, you know, stop the advance of ISIS, but we're not going to be able to, to win a war against a, a mentality unless we change the thinking. And the only way to change the thinking permanently is to establish peace. And you can't do that through war. This is something that we should have learned a long time ago, especially in the Middle East. Are you suggesting, wait, wait. Are you, are you suggesting that, the, that the civil war among the, are you suggesting that the civil war among the Muslims has to be settled before the Arab-Israelis problem can be settled? No, no, I, I, I'm not prioritizing it. I think that uh, it's very important to solve both of these things. But, you know, we're not, what I'm not seeing, I see the president calling us to war. I don't see anybody calling us to peace. And I think that, you know, what I would like to see is for us to, try to e examine this as a holistic problem. It's not just fighting ISIS right here or blocking Hamas in, in Gaza. This is a regional conflict that is not going to end by war. It has to be, uh, there has to be some kind of regional solution. And there's no effort in that. I think the current administration is not going to engage in it because Kerry has been so, uh, spurned in his efforts. So I don't see that happening, but the consequence is that we're going to go further and further into military conflict, and you see what a great job we do of it, and how it all turns out so well. Um, Jimmy Carter has come to be uh, very unpopular and even reviled by many, especially many yeah. in the uh, Jewish community. They call him, as I'm sure you know, fatuous, uh, a dreamer, ineffective, weak. By the glimpses that you gave us into Camp David, he seemed anything but that. Yeah. Courageous, ballsy, crafty. Yeah. Um, my question to you is, since you know him personally, and I'm sure you've observed his presidency and beyond, do you see any justification for those criticisms of him? Well, I think Carter... For one thing, he lost favor with Jews immediately after Camp David, partly because Begin talked about him uh, disparagingly, and people felt that he had pressured Israel, and he did. He pressured Israel to make peace. And, um, you know, it's, is there another American president that gave Israel something more important than Jimmy Carter gave to Israel? I don't think so. So I, on balance, I think that the, the vituperation that is directed at Carter is unfair. But it's true that he's tonally deaf about a lot of things. And uh, when he titled his book, you know, using the word apartheid, a word commonly heard in Israel, but it, it sounds different coming from an American president. That really set off a firestorm. I don't think he expected it. I, um, but it's typical of him to wade into this problem. Um, I, I think he ought to be treated with a little more respect where this is concerned, given the sacrifice that he made. Um, he was, after Camp David, the only, he became the only Democratic nominee for president to not gain a majority of the Jewish vote. Uh, it was a kind of immediate turn against him. And, um, and I have a hard time accounting for that. Peace through development is a concept and a policy that has been adopted by the BRICS nation worldwide. Recently, Egypt has been brought into that concept. And within Egypt itself, uh, General al-Sisi has uh, 
declared and has started the enlargement of the Suez Canal for both deeper ships and uh, faster movement through there. In eight days, um, within Egypt itself, uh, bonds, they weren't called bonds, but they were restricted to Egyptian citizens and having a, like a five-year duration without any trade possible. And within eight days, uh, this uh, 100% of the 12 billion uh, Egyptian uh, uh, pound, I don't Pounds, know what yeah. union it was, yeah. uh, was uh, subscribed. And uh, they have uh, uh, now undertaken the uh, construction of this enlargement of the canal, which is expected to be completed uh, next year. Now, this kind of approach is something that this piece through development is something that potentially could be brought into the, uh, with Israel also, and in this whole Mideast. However, this is not going to be permitted as long as we have this constant, uh, what, um, appeal to the, uh, the terrorism ISIS is one form of that. Al-Qaeda is another form of that. But these are being financed by uh, such kingdoms as Saudi Arabia. So the question is, do you see a peace through development as a possibility worldwide? Well, it's one of the... When people ask me about where terrorism come from, you know, there are many sources, and it's not just poverty, and it's not just joblessness, and it's not just religion, and I just say it's despair. Uh, you know, it, through the Muslim world, there is a great river of despair, and, um, and it's not everybody becomes a terrorist who's despairing, but you're going to have a lot more of it. And development, I think, hope would diminish the kind of radicalism that we see inflaming this whole region. And I'm, I'm struck by how much more, uh, how, how the spread of radicalism in the, since 9-11, uh, going all the way down Nigeria and Mali, and Zawafri just announced they're opening an Al-Qaeda branch in India. Uh, this is, is proliferating in chapters, not in, you know, great, you know, ISIS is really extraordinary, but, you know, the spread of the radical idea has not been tamped down. It seems now to have been amplified. And this is one of the reasons I feel so urgent in the need to kind of bring the prospect of peace to the table, because you can fight it here, you can fight it there, but, you know, the more you fight it, the more it seems to spring up elsewhere and, and to feed off our uh, engagement in that region. So we have to be really careful. For instance, my feeling about ISIS is they provoked us into this war, uh, cutting off the heads of journalists and aid workers and uh, to make sure that America would get involved. And why would that be? Well, ISIS is an organization that has no allies. It's surrounded by enemies. But if you make America your enemy, you suddenly have an awful lot of allies. And I think we have to really think as they think and wonder, you know, what are we getting pulled into? Last question right here. Um, I just wondered if you could contrast uh, that Camp David with President Clinton's efforts um, to, in effect, do a repeat performance. Uh, how much uh, uh, do you think it's a large topic. How much of the failure of Clinton's efforts reflected, you know, the intractability of the issues, the the difference in the personalities, the um, the different domestic situation that each of those men had, and other factors? Well, I'm not an expert on it, so I, I'm going to disqualify myself to that extent. But I understand why Yasser Arafat didn't take the deal. 
uh, there were a lot of problems from uh, the perspective of Palestinian politics, and they couldn't return. There was, you know, there was going to be a very circumscribed area of land to be demilitarized on. But I wish he had taken the deal, because the drift of events now is so radical, and. Um, so I, you know, right now under the Oslo process, you know, the, it was divided into A, B, C, the West Bank, you know, and S Area C is 60% of the West Bank, and there's a strong movement in Israel now to annex that. And so the question arises, if two states, what would that state, that second state be? Is there even, a, I mean, have we been deluding ourselves for years that a second state is even possible? I think the way things are going now, you, if there were a second state, it would be a second Gaza. It would be encompassed by Israeli forces and maybe fenced off. And uh, Well, we don't want that. Uh, you know, this, this is, it's time for fresh thinking. And at Camp David, one of the things that Arom Barak told me was that he was promoting the concept of a confederation. Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, you know, in a kind of maybe EU type of situation or something like that that is, you know, uh, each, there's autonomy within each of these governments, but there's a unity into it as well. Um, I think, let's, you know, if, if two states aren't going to work, okay, we, let's, let's face up to it. Maybe the settlers have made that impossible. And Maybe the mood in Israel is not to accommodate it, but something has to happen because, you know, things are drifting into the, the language that I hear from both sides right now uh, is really that of annihilation, and we have to get away from that. I want to remind you that Lawrence Wright will sign books in the atrium. We hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity. Thanks to all of you, but most of all, thank you, Lawrence Wright, for thank coming. Thank you. Thank you.